Hello and welcome to Soapbox Sacramento. I am your guest tonight, James Israel. Tonight we got a great show. Uh, I'm going to be talking to Eric Baldwin, uh, an award-winning actor, about his new role in a play at California Stage called RFK, which uh, has implications um, with the election coming up and all that. And we're going to get into that and uh, the. Uh, interesting parallels between RFK and Bernie Sanders even. We're going to talk a little about that too. Uh, but before we get to that, let me talk to you about the sponsors. We have um, Pieces Pizza by the Slice, including low-fat vegan, vegan and gluten-free options, as well as a fine selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. We thank them for supplying pizza for the crew. They're on 21st Street near Capitol Avenue in Sacramento. And the Humor Times, which bills itself as the world's funniest news source. The monthly political humor magazine is available worldwide by subscription in print or digital format. More info, along with cartoons, funny fake news, videos, and more can be found at humortimes.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you're on Facebook, please check us out at facebook.com slash soapboxsack. And uh, give us your feedback, make suggestions for future shows. Uh, and be sure to check out all our past shows on YouTube. Uh, just put Soapbox Sacramento in the search box. We hope you'll comment on the shows and share the good ones with uh, your friends. But that's all of them, right? They're all good. And uh, last but not least, we'd like to thank our wonderful volunteers behind the scenes who make each show possible. We couldn't do it without those guys. And I uh, really appreciate that. So let's get to it. Uh, we got tonight Eric Baldwin, actor, award-winning actor even, and uh, the star of the show coming up at California Stage called RFK. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, Eric. And uh, tell us a little bit about the play. Uh, the play uh, is called RFK, and of course it's about FDR, but no one says that. <laughs> um, it's about Bobby Kennedy. It starts about nine months after the assassination of President Kennedy, okay. and takes us all the way up to um, uh, the end, and spoilers, he dies. Um, and it kind of explores his time as Attorney General, his time as a Senator for New York, uh, some of his outreach programs to South Africa and other places he visited, uh, Chile uh, is one that comes to mind. Um, but it also deals with the personality of a guy, and I think it's the last time we've seen it in the American experience, who truly ran for president when he really didn't want to do it, but felt a moral obligation mm -hmm. because of who he was and what he could get done. I don't think he wanted to be president. Mm. Um, and there was something, there was a certain element of fatalism about how he ran his campaign, which ended up being quite advantageous to him, you know, when he was winning. Uh, in Nebraska and Indiana and, and eventually California. Right. That's interesting. I've never heard that point of view that he didn't really want to run. Well, you know, honestly, he wasn't going to depose LBJ. He wasn't going to fight, right. which coincidentally his brother would do later on in 1980 uh, as senator from Massachusetts. He, he ran against Carter in the primary. Right. Um, then I'm sure there have been other examples, but those are the two that come to mind. So it's interesting that that Bobby was thinking about it, but you know, the, some of the party elders, uh, some of his own advisors, who'd worked on the 1960 campaign with Jack, just told him, just wait, four more years, don't do it now. Right. Um, and then um, Johnson, Johnson announced he wasn't going to run. Yeah, and that changed everything. Right. Because um, Eugene, Senator Eugene McCarthy had um, uh, gotten 42% of the vote in the New Hampshire primary at that time. Right. And I think Bobby was kind of amazed at, at that can happen. Right. Um, but because he did come in before Johnson dis decided McCarthy? to step yeah. up and out. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that probably has a lot to do with why he decided to step out because he. Yeah, because like I don't want to necessarily popularity. get in the middle. And there was already animosity between LBJ and Bobby. I mean, they couldn't be in the same room together. Um, it, was, it was pretty toxic. Um, some of my research is uh, there's a lot of uh, similar stories about the first time LBJ and Bobby met. And they literally described them as like, you know, dogs circling each other in the junkyard, you know, just, uh -huh. you know, sniffing each other out. Yeah, RFK uh, didn't like the idea of him on the ticket, really. He didn't think it matched. In 1960? What, what for Johnson, getting yeah. as vice president? Yeah, what oh no, JFK Bobby was, wanted to do, yeah. Bo Bobby was very much against it, and Jack realized the political necessity of it. Right. And, he, and Jack was pretty pragmatic. Yeah. And he was like, you know what, I think he's a son of a gun too, but we cannot possibly win the South without Johnson. 
and you know Bobby was against it. I think eventually Bobby realized, okay, that's our key to the White House. But and as it turned out, it was a very close election that first one. Very close. Yeah. Very close. Um, um, well, yeah, I'm always surprised one. Nixon didn't contest actually. Uh huh. Because it sounds like a Nixon thing to do. Yeah. Right. You know. <laughs> but um, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, good for him for not doing it. But yeah. Um, so it sounds like it's going to be a great, uh, great show. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, it's at the California Stage Complex, but it's actually in the Wilkerson Theater. The Wilkerson Theater. Theater, named after Dennis Wilkerson, the founder Dennis, of California right. Stage. And that's all in that R25 Arts Complex. Yep. It's uh, at the intersection of R and 25th. And I'll give you a little um, bit of trivia. three different stages there. Yeah. I'll give you some trivia. I was in the very first show ever in that space. Uh-huh. And uh -huh. that was uh, years ago. <laughs> the Dennis Wilkerson space. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good, good. Uh, well, speaking of uh, your past and... Uh, <laughs> God, you, you literally made me nervous when you said that. <laughs> yeah. I uh, those well, pictures were gone. Well, we agreed before the show that we weren't going to bring up certain, <laughs> things, uh, certain dark secrets. Yeah. Uh, no. But um, tell us a little bit about uh, previous roles you've done and maybe your favorites. And, uh, uh, I could I could help uh, spark yeah, your memory. You're... I have uh, name says, one. I'll say says, something. Since you were uh, you played Macbeth, I did. You played several Shakespeare roles. Yep. Macbeth, uh, Henry V, Romeo, even Romeo, uh, Bottom, Bottom and Shylock. What is that? Bottom and Shylock. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom Midsummer Night's Dream, Shylock, Merchant of Venice. Oh, okay. So, uh, what's your favorite uh, Shakespeare role then? <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, sometimes it's about the role, sometimes it's about the experience you had with it. Um, Henry V was really interesting because um, a friend of mine was directing it and didn't want me anywhere near it. <laughs> and um, I knew he was setting it up to be, a, uh, this is back in 2003, I believe I played that. He was setting it up to be kind of a, a parallel to what was going on in the Bush administration because we were getting ready to go into Iraq. Mm -hmm. I think we were already in Afghanistan at that point. Okay. Um, and then Bush came out and did his State of the Union speech. And I was watching it, and I was getting angrier and angrier until I finally picked up the phone and said, you better cast me as, as a saint because I really want to stick it to that guy. Um, but it was a fascinating experience. We actually opened the show uh, two days after the first bombs landed in Baghdad. So it's very timely. Right. It was really done as a protest production. We used, uh, it was actually subtitled um, Henry V, Masters of War, after the Bob oh. Dylan piece. Uh -huh. right. Um, and uh, it was very much geared toward that. And also the idea of covering the war almost like a sports event as, as the media right. kind of like really started to feed on itself. Uh, that I way. noticed that. Uh, they, they really did cover it like a sports event. Oh, it was they? like professional wrestling at times. Yeah, they had the, all the little, you know, splashy title things that they came up with. Oh, yeah, theme songs. Rah, rah, you know. We actually did oh, the Battle of Agincourt as a, a, a professional wrestling match. <laughs> Um, well, let's see. What else have you done? Um, Lee Atwater in Atwater. Yeah, that was uh, my first one-man show, and I think that was about five years ago. Hmm. Um, yeah, so this is definitely sides of the coin. Lee Atwater, Bobby mm -hmm. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that was a pretty fascinating uh, production. Maybe a little easier to do in some ways because people may know who Lee Atwater was, but they don't really remember what he looked like, what he sounded like, or some of the specifics. Right. Yeah, it's... Uh, Probably hard to do someone like RFK who's so iconic. And yeah, and the, the way to solve that is to take a look at it from the other side. So I'm not playing, I, I like to think of it this way. Uh, I'm not trying to make you pretend that I'm Bobby. I want you to remember Bobby like me. Right. Um, I remember when I saw the film Nixon, the Anthony Hopkins film, and I was very impressed by his performance. He doesn't look a thing like Nixon, didn't really right. sound like Nixon, but for about an hour afterwards, I couldn't remember what Richard Nixon actually looked like. I, I had trouble conjuring it in uh -huh. my brain. Uh -huh. that's interesting. Um, and I think that's the only way you can handle biographies, unless you're Daniel Day-Lewis. And uh, yeah. sadly, I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Um, so uh, in the play, RFK, um, it says it, it looks back at the events leading up to his decision to run. Oh, there's the poster for it. Yeah. <laughs> you said you're not real fond of that picture of you. Huh? Uh, I just take think that's how I look like. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's all actor ego. That's all just you know, me being ridiculous. But there's some good info there. It starts October 28th and runs through November 26th. That's every uh, Friday and Saturday at 8 and 8 Sunday matinees at 2. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, every weekend during that time. So get on down there and check it out. Um, and uh, the, uh, California State does a lot of um, kind of political, more edgy stuff. A lot more, I think, than most. Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Canada. And I think uh, originals. Original. A lot of original shows. Yeah. Um, how old is this? particular play. I believe it was, it was written, written by Jack Holmes. Jack Holmes. I believe it was written in 2003 okay. or 2004. Uh, but our, uh, California Stage, as an aside, they just got a um, Ellie, the local Ellie Award I believe they did, for yeah. the writing in uh, a new script, uh, A Revolutionary Mind, yeah. which they just, that's the last one that just finished. I right? believe it is. Yeah. Yes. I saw that. Great show. Um, Okay, uh, you also worked at uh, Universal Studios Entertainment, I noticed, <laughs> for six years. What did you do there? Did, uh, did you I, act um, or were you... Well, yeah, I, 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 like many people, um, I, you know, showed up to an open call because I had just moved to Los Angeles. I was looking for a job, and that sounded interesting. Um, I started as a tour guide, then a VIP tour guide, a show host. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, it was, it was an interesting job in that... You know, weird things happen at any job, but extremely weird things happen at this job. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't uncommon to, like, you know, come back after doing a tour, throw down your microphone and say, oh, if Jim Carrey does that to me one more time. <laughs> um, but I got what to do... What did he do to you? Tell, uh, tell oh, us a good story. <laughs> did I sign a confidentiality? I may have signed a confidentiality agreement. I'm oh, not sure. Oh, really I seriously? may have. <laughs> I don't know. But no, it was great. I mean, and yeah. you could, you know, there, there was a lot to explore and a lot to learn, and right. you got to meet a lot of interesting people. I'll bet. Um... So uh, this play captures uh, Bobby Kennedy's passion for igniting a fire in young people who are angry and critical and are dropping out because they love their country and uh, fighting against the national leadership he felt that was calling upon the darker impulses of the human spirit. So that sounds uh, somewhat like Bernie Sanders to me. Now this is not from this play, this is No, you, this is from uh, a production of um, Arcadia by Tom Stoppard. Okay. And uh, the woman you, there. You look very interested in that, that woman there in that show. <laughs> uh, now yeah. this one, this, this is from like a California stage production, Children of Light, okay. which is a kind of a retelling of a Greek myth. Right, right. That, uh, was that a photo? Because it almost looked like a painting. That's a beautiful photo. Yeah, yeah. really nice. The photographer's great. Um, so we're getting to the um, similarities between RFK and um, Bernie Sanders. And um, I think there are some similar similarities also historically in, in where the country's at. You know, there was a lot of turmoil then that was Vietnam War, um, uh, the rise of the um, the uh, social issues with uh, the civil rights and all that, and um, and I think you know there's the, all the inequality there um, that people demanded be dealt with, and that's kind of like where we're at now. Only it's more economic inequality, and and that's Bernie Sanders' big thing. Um, so can you speak to the similar similarities that you see? You know, I think it's interesting. Um, Bernie Sanders kind of came of age politically in the early 1960s, you know, participating in some of the civil rights uh, activism and such. And the 60s really was a time of change, uh, from my limited understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find fascinating, though, is the 60s and now were both preceded by decades of an economic boom. Mm -hmm. 1950s, all of a sudden people had refrigerators mm -hmm. and they, you know, it was kind of, and processed food and everything kind of working that way. And all these comforts they never had before. In the 1990s, we had a huge economic boom. We had the internet and, and the uh, uh, eventual popping of that. But again, a lot of money kind of s starting to come in, into people's hands. And I think in those type of decades, that's when we tend to get socially complacent. Mm -hmm. And and then the 1960s happened, and of course, you know, eventually it takes maybe a decade for people to realize, well, God, what was going on before was garbage. Why, why can't we really do some things? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that now. You're seeing that with the uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, mm -hmm. You're taking, you're, and we're seeing a lot more um, examples of people kind of taking action and taking some responsibility for their place in our society. Right. So you know, again, very similar there. Um, what I thought was criminal about the Sanders campaign uh, was the fact that, you know, in 1968, you could assassinate Bobby Kennedy. All you have to do today to a political candidate is not cover them. 
Mm -hmm. And so it w literally was a media assassination in some ways mm -hmm. of Bernie Sanders. He mm -hmm. was filling up huge, huge, huge right. arenas. Right. But you never heard about that. Right. You had to, you know, eventually go to the shot of, you know, a hundred people crowded around a small stage in an enormous uh, room with Donald Trump speaking in the primaries. Right, right. Um, and there, there were um, rumors that he was filling a lot of those halls with paid. Uh, oh, no doubt. Paid people to get off the street. Um, yeah, they, they both filled large halls. Uh, actually, Robert Kennedy too um, mm -hmm. uh, had record turnouts, um, fifteen thousand, nineteen thousand, and then uh, Sanders was doing the same thing. They're both very popular with the people and they had they both had a way of just talking to people rather than you know Adam and and rather than the typical campaign stump speech yeah, yeah. slogans and so on they really both um, dealt with the real issues that people were concerned with and I think that's where their their real popularity came out and like you say um, you know there was kind of a media blackout around Bernie especially early on and Really, unless you were active on social media, you didn't really know much about them, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a real shame for sure. Um, but that was also an era, too, in the 1960s, and, and particularly with Bernie, where intelligence was uh, celebrated rather than mocked. Right, right. And <laughs> Imagine I think, that. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of, I, I listened to Bernie, and he was the one clarion voice that made any sense to me during that. Right. The problem is, of course, with Trump and with Hillary and with all the other candidates is that the language of politics today is insincerity. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, people hear enough insincerity. They may not know it when they hear it, but it processes in, and they know it eventually. Right. It does sink in. Right. Um, and that's why I think um, both Bernie and actually Trump uh, appeal to their respective audiences. You know, people think of Trump as being uh, sincere, uh, supposedly. Um, I don't see that because he lies so much. How can you be sincere when you're every time fibs Donald Trump lies stuff up? You know. Yeah. Anytime somebody <laughs> lies, cuff. Donald Trump gets a royalty. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. But um, so, but that is, the, I think, the appeal that they're not your typical politician. You know, um, and on on the right, you know, they they couldn't go for Bernie because. He's a Democrat, and that's that. You know, to a lot of people on the right, that's basically evil. You know, but anyway. Well, so, it's also mixing up the concept of democratic socialist with socialism, which are two completely different concepts. Right. So let me run a, a quote by you, and uh, see uh, see if you can guess who said this. Oh, okay. One of those two. Uh, a revolution is coming. A revolution which will be peaceful if we are wise enough, compassionate if we care enough, successful if we are fortunate enough. But a revolution which is coming whether we, we will it or not. We can affect its character. We cannot alter its inevitability. Gerald Ford. That's no. kind of um, one of those no, Yeah, yeah no, no, no. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say that's Bobby. Yeah. Okay, that's I got Bobby. that one right. All that's right, Bobby. Good. But you could, you could, uh, oh, I could hear, hear okay. Bernie saying that, too. Yeah. Uh, he talked enough oh, about political revolution, obviously. Um, that was kind of his slogan. Um, so what else? What other uh, similarities? Um, uh, now Bernie talks a lot about corporate greed, but he also pickets with protesters. Uh, you know, he puts his mouth where his where his, uh, your, his time where his mouth is. And uh, you know, most politicians they don't do anything like that. You know, they're not going to be actually getting in there in a march mm -hmm. with the with the rebel. Um, and I think um, I can't think of any particular. Uh, uh, examples of uh, Bobby doing that, but uh, he, you know, he just seemed like a man of the people too. Yeah, um, I, I think you know it's interesting too because the idea of corporate greed, while well, corporate greed existed in the late '60s, it wasn't as big a concern as it is now. Right. Because a lot of you know things have been torn down, Glass Steagall and, and such. Um, and you know, honestly, I mean, a lot of blame does lie at Bill Clinton's feet for yeah. some of his um, uh, legislation in the 90s, which allowed for a big economic boom. Right. But, you know, that's short term as opposed to long term. Right. No, that's true. Uh, you know, the, the Democrats are definitely not, um, you know, their hands aren't totally clean uh, no. by a long shot. And, uh, you know, and that's the rub against Hillary by a lot of um, people who supported Bernie and they say they won't vote for her because she's so corporate, basically. Mm -hmm. And, I, and that's, I a valid, that. that's a valid argument. That, that is valid. Uh, to me, it's like, well, 
you know, the boat is sinking, you know, uh, we've got Hillary Clinton, she, she'll plug it till we get to shore and we can rebuild the, the ship, uh, whereas Bernie, you know, is a square peg and try to fit that in there, the boat's still going to sink. Well, I think uh, the, the Not Bernie, I mean um, Donald. Donald, yeah. I think, I think one of the main problems with Hillary as a candidate, and which I never understood why the, the, the far right was so, um, uh, treated her so as a pariah, you know, so, and, and so negatively, because in essence, she's practically a Republican. She practically Economically, is. anyway. Yeah, yeah she's a, not on the social issues. Not, not as much. I mean, she's definitely yeah. more on the social issues, but, I mean, she's a dino, dim dim Democrat in name only. Yeah. Um, this well, is a woman a who once worked for uh, Barry Goldwater. Yeah. Which is hard to fathom. Right, right, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was really early on. That was early on. She was still forming who she yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if you really look at uh, her whole career, I mean, uh, all, a lot of these criticisms um, shrink in comparison to, to the fact that she's worked decades on, on issues that, uh, you know, tirelessly, women's issues uh, mm -hmm. for the poor. Children. Um, you know, it, to me, there's just no, any, any attempt to compare the two, Donald Trump and her, is, uh, you know, there's no real comparison, I don't think. Um, but no. anyway, back to the play <laughs> and, uh, and the comparisons. I, I wanted to say one more, one more thing, which was uh, Kennedy uh, let, let it known that he was frustrated uh, that 5.8 million was spent on political advertising in the 1956 presidential campaign. <laughs> and, and now compare that to 2 billion spent in the 2012 and more this year, I'm sure. Well, you know, a billion here, a billion there. Yeah, yeah. It eventually, it will add up. Right. Um, <laughs> eventually, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and it's being, you know, it's uh, we're selling our politics to the highest bidder, and that's just not right. So we are. That's to me is the main issue, and it's been that for a long time. Is we have to get the big money out of politics, mm -hmm. and and so that the, our representatives will represent the people who vote not the big money that backs their campaign. Do you think that can truly happen? I mean, let's say that does occur, mm -hmm. that, that we take the money out of politics. Don't you think that political corruption is like water on pavement and that it will find every crack, we'll just have to have to solve something else? Sure. And I think getting money out of it, don't get me wrong, I think right. it's a fantastic and yeah. much needed idea. Right. I just think we need to, we need a catalytic, it's almost like our political minds need, you know, some electroshock therapy, yeah. just kind of reboot <laughs> ourselves and, hey, this is what this is supposed to be. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, point well taken, I think that's always going to be a problem for any type of system, any country, because, um, you know, money corrupts, you know, and, and it's always there and it's going to be in the background, whether or not it's as, as you know, um, allowed through the law like it is now or it's you know, under the table, um, you're always going to have to fight that. Yeah. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, there's always going to be uh, candidates that talk out the side of their mouth and, you know, once they get in office, they're, they don't care, whatever. But um, there will always be some righteous people out there, too, like RFK and Bernie Sanders. And, uh, well, I hope, you know, it's very interesting. You know, Bobby talked a lot about how, uh, you know, the, the young are a future, and it's not a, an age. It's a state of mind. It's being open and not closed off to new ideas. Right. And, uh, you know, Bobby was certainly, you know, uh, you know of, of an age that young people necessi shouldn't necessarily have trusted him. You know, don't trust anyone over 30. Right. Um, and yet he was very open to these things. He was, he's also very open about... You know, the, the work he did on civil rights, um, you know, he, he says in the play, actually, he says, you know, when I was younger, I really didn't think at all about civil rights. I mean, what opportunities did a Kennedy, you know, at, at Martha's Vineyard have to meet a black man? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it didn't really happen as such. Mm -hmm. um, but Bobby was one of the kids who did travel the most very young because he lived in New York for two years, Florida, all around, uh, primarily because dad's investments. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, I think he probably had a little wider view. And he wasn't the same as his brothers. He was raised very differently. He was almost raised like one of the sisters in mm -hmm. many ways. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask something and <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> that never happens to me. <laughs> um, so this play uh, is going uh, October 28th through November 26th. Yes. Um, and one of our performance dates is actually Bobby's birthday. 
Oh, November excellent. 20th. Yeah. Well, the timing is great. Um, you know, that it's starting right before the election. Um, that's going to be on people's minds, and um, it's all about a presidential campaign, basically. I'm curious as to what happens after the election to the very next performance. Uh huh. Yes. If we're going to have buyer's remorse, yeah. or it, there's going to uh -huh. be a. I, I'm really curious as to what kind of energy is going to come into the theater uh, good, right uh, after that point. Tuesday. So you'll have two weekends before the. Two weekends before, and the election. rest is after. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That, that'll. Uh, Probably color the the the, the, per, the performances from that week before to the week after. It'd be interesting to kind of compare those two. <laughs> All of a sudden, Bobby's gonna hopefully just depress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did I do this for? <laughs> well, um, it's gonna be great. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Want to tell people to tune in next week. We've got a great show coming up with. Um, the fellow that threw the pie in the face of uh, Mayor Johnson. He's a really interesting character. He's got a lot of good things to say. So uh, come back next week for that. Uh, look at our stuff on YouTube and um, share it. You know, let other people know about the show. We could, uh, we'd really appreciate that. And uh, go see um, RFK. RFK. Starting October 28th. Yes. Um, at Wilkerson Theater in the California stage uh, uh, complex there. Yes. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming. Thank you. Uh, Eric Baldwin's been our guest, and um, we've got a little more time. Anything else you'd like to say? Um, uh, well, how much time do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have much, about 30 seconds maybe. Um, come see the show. Um, I promise that uh, uh, you will learn something. Excellent. That's, um, that's very uh, mysterious way to put it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a different ending. RFK actually fights back and beats her ass around. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Well, that'll be good. So uh, what else? What else? We've got more time. No, we don't. There's some music. All right. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> Boy, I miss Justin.